apply Digger. Heidegger's thinking in being and time explained with Simon Critchley. Episode one, Heidegger's project in being and time. Martin Heidegger, who lived from 1889 to 1976, was the most important, the most influential, and the most infamous philosopher in the continental tradition in the 20th century. Being in Time, which was first published in 1927, was his magnum opus. There's no way of understanding what took place in philosophy particularly in what we call continental philosophy after Heidegger, without coming to terms with being in time. Whether Heidegger's influence is felt positively in thinkers like Jean-Paul Sartre, Merleau-Ponty, Hannah Arendt, Gadamer, Foucault, and Derrida, or negatively in figures like Rudolf Carnap, Adorno, Habermas, Deleuze, and others, whether positive or negative, Heidegger cast a very long shadow over philosophy right down to the present day. Furthermore, unlike many Anglo-American philosophers, Heidegger has exerted a huge influence outside philosophy in areas as diverse as architecture, contemporary art, social theory, political theory, psychotherapy, psychiatry, theology, and indeed in the world of business. So the purpose of these, um, these shows, of these episodes, is to try and explain Heidegger's project in being in time, paragraph by paragraph. So let's begin. Being in time is a work of considerable length, 437 pages in the German original, and of legendary difficulty. The difficulty is caused by the fact that Heidegger sets himself the task of what he calls a destruction of the history of philosophy, a destruction of the philosophical tradition. We'll see some of the implications of this destruction in future episodes. But the initial consequence is that Heidegger refuses to avail himself of the standard terminology of philosophy, particularly modern philosophy, with its talk of epistemology, subjectivity, consciousness, mind, representation, objectivity, and the rest. Heidegger has the audacity to go back to the drawing board and invent a new philosophical vocabulary. For example, he thinks that all conceptions of the human being as a subject, as a person, as consciousness, or indeed as a mind-brain unity, are hostages to a tradition of thinking whose presuppositions have not been thought through radically enough. So Heidegger is a, a thinker, a radical thinker, in the sense in which he's a thinker who tries to dig down to the roots of our lived experience of the world rather than accepting the authority of tradition. And that's what makes his work often difficult to understand, particularly in translation. Heidegger doesn't use the standard philosophical language, but rather tries to invent a language of his own. So Heidegger won't talk about the subject, consciousness, mind, or indeed body. Heidegger's name for the human being is what he calls Dasein. And that term, Dasein, can be variously translated, but it's usually rendered as being there. The basic and very simple idea is that the human being is first and foremost not an isolated being, not an isolated subject or self cut off from a realm of objects that it wishes to know about. Rather, we're beings who are always already in the world, 
outside and alongside a world from which, for the most part, we do not distinguish ourselves. We'll come back to this point uh, repeatedly. It's hugely important that for Heidegger, we're always already outside in the world. And we do not, for the most part, distinguish ourselves from the world. Dasein, as Heidegger says, is being in the world. And what goes for Dasein, being there, also goes for many of Heidegger's other concepts. Sometimes this makes being in time a very tough read, which is not helped by the fact that Heidegger, more than any other modern philosopher, exploits the linguistic possibilities of his native language, in his case, German. Although uh, John Macquarie and Edward Robinson, in their 1962 Blackwell English translation of Being in Time, produce one of the classics of modern philosophical translation, in my view, reading Being in Time can sometimes feel like wading through a conceptual mud of Baroque and unfamiliar concepts. But that's fine, and that's what we're going to try and work through and work against. We're going to try and bring out Heidegger's basic thoughts in a way that is um, that we can make sense of and use in our day-to-day -day lives. That said, that Heidegger's text is superficially difficult, uh, kind of unpleasant to read in translation. That said, the basic idea of being in time is extremely simple. The book is called Being and Time. The thesis of the book is being is time. Being is time. That is, what it means for a human being to be is to exist temporally in the stretch between birth and death. Being is time, and time is finite. Finite, it comes to an end with our death. Therefore, if we want to understand what it means to be a human being, and what Heidegger will call an authentic human being, then it's essential that we constantly project our lives onto the horizon of our death, what Heidegger calls being towards death. Crudely stated, for thinkers like St. Paul, St. Augustine, Luther, and Kierkegaard, thinkers who are very much on Heidegger's mind in this period and in being in time, for thinkers like that, it's through the relation to God that the self finds itself. It's through the relation to God that the self finds itself. And the way this often works in someone like, uh, say, Augustine. His, Augustine will ask the question, who am I in relation? Who am I, O oh God? It's the question of the self. It's a question that is open in relationship to the experience of divine perfection, which usually means finding myself imperfect and sinful. Now, Heidegger raises the question of the self and what the self is, but without reference to God. So for Heidegger, the self can only become what it truly is through a confrontation with death by making a meaning out of our finitude. If our being is finite, if our being is finite, then what it means to be human consists in grasping this finitude. In, as Heidegger will say in Being in Time, quoting Nietzsche, in becoming who one is, becoming who one is. And I want to show how this insight into our finitude is, is deepened in, in Heidegger's thought in relationship to uh, ultimately to his concepts of conscience, which we'll get to in later episodes. And then uh, towards the end, the idea of ecstatic temporality ecstatic temporality. But the, uh, the thing to say at the beginning um, is that Heidegger's thought is a very simple thought, which is, um, in a sense, difficult to grasp because of its simplicity. 
His thought is that we are a throne open clearing of finitude, a throne open clearing of finite existence without ground, without metaphysics, without any basis. We're a purely finite stretch of time. And whatever it means to be us has to be understood in relationship to that. So let's, uh, let's press on a little bit and look at the, um, the project of being in time. As Heidegger makes clear from the um, opening page of Being in Time, which is an, an untitled page, uh, which begins with a quotation from, from Plato, from Plato's uh, late dialogue, The Sophist. Uh, as Plato makes clear from this, sorry, <laughs> as Heidegger makes clear from the untitled opening page of Being in Time, what's at stake in the book is the question of the meaning of being. The question of the meaning of being. This is the question that Aristotle raised in an untitled manuscript written two and a half thousand years ago, which became known at a, at a later date as the metaphysics. Aristotle didn't use that term, that was just the way in which the book was catalogued in a, in a library at a later date. The metaphysics, namely that which comes after physics. But what Aristotle says in, this, uh, in these lectures, again, you know, two and a half millennia and counting ago, for Aristotle there is a science or a form of knowledge that investigates what he calls being as such. Being as such without any regard to any specific realms of being, namely the being of living things, what we would now call biology, or the being of the natural world, physics. Metaphysics is the area of inquiry that Aristotle himself calls, he uses this word, he calls it first philosophy, philosophia prote, which comes before anything else. It is the most abstract, universal, and undefinable area of philosophy. But it is also, it is also the most fundamental area of philosophy. Now, with Admirable arrogance. Heidegger was still relatively young when he wrote this book, was writing this book, Being in Time. It's the question of the meaning of being that Heidegger sets himself the task of inquiring into in Being in Time. He begins with a series of rhetorical questions. He says, do we have an answer to the question of the meaning of being? Not at all, he answers. Do we even experience any perplexity about this question? Not at all, Heidegger repeats. Therefore, the first and most important task of Heidegger's book, Being in Time, is to recover our perplexity for this question of questions, this question of being, this question which we might know, for example, as Hamlet's question. To be or not to be, that is the question. So the task in being in time couldn't be bigger. The frame for being in time couldn't be bigger. The question of the meaning of being. Um, a key word in being in time, um, in the early paragraphs of being in time, is the following word, it is access, the question of access. So given that the, the question that Heidegger is trying to raise is the question of the meaning of being, the question that that raises is what is our access to the question of the meaning of being? Although Heidegger will try to access the question of being in different ways in his later work, uh, he'll do that uh, through more kind of historical meditations. Um, indeed, in his work, he continues to experiment with different forms of writing. In Being in Time, 
access to the question of the meaning of being is given through that being who can raise such a question, right? Access to the question of the meaning of being is given through that being who can raise such a question. That is, the question of the meaning of being is a question for the being whose being is in question. Whose being is in question? Well, that's where we come in. For Heidegger, what defines the human being is this capacity to be perplexed by the deepest and most enigmatic of questions. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why is there? Why is there being and what does it mean? So the task of being in time is reawakening in us a taste for perplexity, a taste for questioning. Questioning as a movement into perplexity. And questioning, as Heidegger will say much later on in his writings, is the piety of thinking. Now, if we turn to the first line of being in time, and I'm going to be moving through the text now as, you know, um, as closely as I can, but I know you're listening to this and not necessarily reading along, so I'm not going to assume that you have the book in your hands. But if you just kind of imagine the opening of the book, this is paragraph nine, where the existential analytic of Dasein, of us, really begins. The first line of the text is the following. We are ourselves the entities to be analysed. We are ourselves the entities to be analysed. And this is the key to the first concept that is introduced in Being in Time, the concept of mindness, mindness. Um, in German, that's the, the word jemeinigkeit. And this is how the book begins. If I am the being for whom being is a question, to be or not to be, then the question of being is mine to be. It's mine to be one way or another. So in what then does the being of being human consist insofar as that is my being? Heidegger's answer is existence. Right? Existence. Therefore, the question of the meaning of being, this big question that he frames the book with, is to be accessed by way of what Heidegger calls an existential analytic. An existential analytic, an analysis of our existence. But what sort of thing is human existence? What can we say about it? Well, obviously, Human existence is defined by time. We're creatures with a past who move through a present and who available, have available to them a series of possibility. Who have available to them, I'll take that sentence again. It is obviously defined by time. We are creatures with a past who move through a present and who have available to them a series of possibilities or what Heidegger calls in the first paragraphs of Being in Time, ways to be, namely ways to be in the future. So to say that the being of being human is existence is to say that the being of being human is defined by time, by past, by present, and by ways to be, by future. Now Heidegger's point here is wonderfully, wonderfully simple. Although the language that he uses to, to describe it is rather rebarbative. But the point is simple. The human being is not definable by a what. The human being is not definable by a what, like a table or a chair. But rather by a who. By a who that is shaped by existence in time. What it means to be human is to exist with a certain past 
a personal, cultural history, and by an open series of possibilities that I can seize hold of or not. Right? So my existence is temporal. It's shaped by my personal cultural history, what Heidegger's gonna call later on in Being in Time, thrownness. I'm thrown into the world, and in my thrownness into that world, a series of possibilities opens up for me, which I can grab hold of or not. And this brings me to an important point. If the being of being human is defined by mindness, by the fact that it is mine, then my being is not a matter of indifference to me. A table or a chair cannot recite Hamlet's soliloquy or undergo the experience of self-questioning and self-doubt that such words express. You can try this for yourselves at home if you like. Ask whichever object is around you, a table, a chair, a bed or whatever, whether it experiences Hamlet's question, to be or not to be. Ask them and you'll hear nothing in reply. But we can. We can ask this question. Dasein is always mine to be one way or another. We can choose ourselves and win ourselves or not and thus lose ourselves. So if what it means to be human is to exist, to exist in time shaped by past, present and future, then that being is mine to be. We can choose ourselves and win ourselves. Alternatively, we can lose ourselves. And this idea of choosing ourselves or losing ourselves is the kernel of Heidegger's idea of authenticity, which is one of the, um, uh, the most discussed elements that came out of Heidegger's being in time, the idea of authenticity, which more accurately expresses what is proper to the human being, what is its own. So we shouldn't think of authenticity so much as a, as, as a good or as something which is like morally superior but really what is proper to us, what is, our, what is our own. And for Heidegger, there are two dominant modes of being human, authenticity and inauthenticity. Furthermore, he will say, we're still here on the first paragraphs of being in time, we have to make a choice. We have a choice to make between these two modes. The choice is whether to be oneself or not to be oneself to be author of oneself and self-authorizing or not. Heidegger insists, as he will do throughout being in time, that inauthenticity does not signify a lower or lesser being. Alternatively, authenticity does not mean a higher state of being. Rather, Heidegger insists that this distinction between authenticity and inauthenticity is not a moral distinction, or what philosophers would call a normative distinction. And let's just say that some philosophers have had doubts about that move in Heidegger's thinking, uh, notably a philosopher like Theodore Adorno, who detects that there is a jargon of authenticity in Heidegger's work. But let's just say that's a a moot point and, uh, and move on. Now, we begin with this idea of mindness. Existence is mine to be, choose myself or lose myself. Authenticity and inauthenticity. Now, regardless of the, these twin modes of authenticity and inauthenticity, Heidegger insists early in being in time that the human being must first be presented in its undifferentiated character. We must first present, have access to the human being in an undifferentiated way, an undifferentiated way, prior to any choice to be authentic or not. 
in words that soon become like a mantra in being in time. Heidegger seeks to describe the human being as it is presented, as he says, proximally and for the most part. The German there is zunächst und zumeist, proximally and for the most part, which can also be translated, perhaps better translated, as most closely and mostly. So Heidegger seeks to describe the human being as it is presented most closely and mostly. Then the question is, well, how are we presented most closely and mostly? The next move that Heidegger makes is, um, you know, devastating, although he makes it in a very kind of straightforward way. He claims that the way in which um, the human being is presented most closely and mostly is in terms of the obviousness of everydayness, in terms of everyday existence. And the character of this everydayness is averageness. Now, we should just take a, a moment to think about the, the radicality of this move. Heidegger in Being and Time is doing philosophy. Um, he insists that philosophy begins and in a sense ends with average everydayness. There's a lovely uh, phrase um, from paragraph nine, I think, of Being in Time, where he says that average everydayness is that out of which all existence uh, arises and into which all existence goes. So we begin with average everydayness and we end up with average everydayness. Now, what's subtly devastating about that, about that move, is that philosophy might begin from average everydayness. This is what, say, Plato describes in, uh, at the, in the middle of the Republic as the cave the cave where we're in this average everyday existence where we see shadows and illusions. But the, uh, the task of philosophy is to leave the cave and have access to the truth of the, the forms and then to return later on to the cave to be, to be killed. But Heidegger wants to stay in the cave and to see the cave differently. We begin thinking and we end thinking within the framework of average everydayness. So philosophy is not some otherworldly speculation as to whether the external world exists or whether human beings are really human beings, other human beings and not robots or whatever, the kind of pseudo questions that philosophers for the most part amuse themselves. Rather philosophy begins with the description of human beings in their average everyday existence. And this description of average everyday existence is what Heidegger calls phenomenology. Right? There's a very kind of technical way of understanding phenomenology, which I won't bore you with. A very simple way of understanding phenomenology is that phenomenology is the description of existence, the description of average everyday existence as it shows itself and as what shows itself can be transformed into language. Right? So phenomenology is the, the letting us see of that which shows itself and language is what lets us see that which shows itself. Now, we begin from average everyday existence. On that basis, Heidegger seeks to derive certain common structures from that everydayness. And these common structures are what Heidegger calls existentials, existentials. So Heidegger's program in Being and Time begins with the thesis which he will, or the proposition that he will say over and over again, Dasein is being in the world. Um, Dasein is being in the world. And the, the task that he sets himself is to deduce the, the common structures of our being in the world. And these common structures, these shared structures, what Heidegger would call the 
a priori structures of existence are what he calls the existentials. Now, but the key thing to, to hang on to here before we get move on further is that Dasein is being in the world. Right? There is no distinction between us and world. Us and world are a unity and that what defines the human being, what defines Dasein, is the transcendence that it has with regard to the world. Right? We are, for Heidegger, first and foremost transcendent beings. Our relationship to that which is, is ecstatic, has a dimension of ecstasy. And um, we'll come back to that in uh, later episodes. But um, we, should note, we should note here the difficulty of the task that Heidegger has set himself. What he's trying to describe, what he wants philosophy to describe, is the way in which uh, human existence shows up most closely and mostly, in the way that is most obvious. But this is fiendishly difficult to describe. Nothing is closer to me than myself, right? Nothing is closer to me than myself in my average, everyday, indifferent existence. But how do I describe this? How do I describe this closeness of myself to myself? Heidegger was fond of quoting from St. Augustine, from Augustine's Confessions, when Augustine writes, assuredly, I labor here and I labor within myself. I have become to myself a land of trouble and inordinate sweat, a land of trouble an inordinate sweat. So what Heidegger is trying to do, and when you're moving through these pages of being in time, you can feel that you're often sweating through these pages, but is to bring out, the labor here is to bring out the character of the obviousness of average everyday existence and to stay with that. So some, um, when you're reading uh, being in time, and really I'm talking here about paragraphs 9 to 13, the first two chapters of Being in Time proper. And it can be a pretty um, unpleasant and bruising experience. Um, I've tried to give you a kind of overview of the, you know, the shape of Heidegger's thought. But uh, there's a couple, of, a couple of things I need to mention. Um, Heidegger makes a distinction between categories and existentials. Now, categories in philosophy are kind of meta-concepts. The idea begins with um, Aristotle. Meta-concepts which are used to divide up uh, our experience of, of things in the world. Now, uh, for Heidegger, categories are ways in which we can understand things which are not us, or as Heidegger will say, entities which are not Dasein. And the, the distinction he's going to make in terms of categories is the distinction between the ready to hand and the present at hand. I just want to say a word about that distinction. I'll make it clearer in the next episode, but just to kind of flag it now. The ready to hand is really the handy. It's really the way in terms of our average everyday existence we, we use things, where things uh, are available to us. And again, I'll say a lot more about this. The present at hand is the way in which those things show up when we look at them theoretically, when we look at them with uh, philosophers' spectacles. And um, Heidegger's uh, view is that the, the fundamental category by which we uh, have an experience of the world is, is handiness, the ready to hand. And on that basis is built the, the present at hand, uh, the theoretical way of viewing things. And he thinks um, that's, the, that's the kind of error of philosophy that we'll come back to. So categories describe 
things which are not Dasein. Dasein, the structure of Dasein, is explained in terms of uh, concepts that Heidegger calls existentials. And these existentials, which are uh, appropriate, Heidegger thinks, for entities like us, who are described with a who and not a what, who have personal pronouns and are not like tables and chairs. These um, existential structures, Heidegger thinks, are prior to everything that we can find in anthropology, psychology, biology, or now in something like neuroscience. And, um, and therefore, this is now we're moving on a tiny bit in, um, in Heidegger's argument. For Heidegger, to get a sense of our existential embeddedness in, in the world and to be able to, to describe that, we have to leave to one side all traditional ideas of the subject, of uh, consciousness, spirit, person, man, life, all of these terms have to be put to one side. If we introduce any of those terms, we are uh, giving ourselves a kind of metaphysical basis by which to understand what it means to be human. And Heidegger wants to understand our humanness, not in metaphysical terms, but in terms of our uh, existential experience. So again, coming back to a point I made earlier, Heidegger thinks that our uh, the vocabulary that we've inherited from philosophy gets in the way. And the task, the philosophical task, is one of destroying that terminology by finding a, a new language. And that new language is a, a language that he tries to kind of invent in being in time. And one more thing, just at the end of this episode, and we're going to move on to the, uh, the next episode, uh, soon, which will be on the concept of world. Um, if we go on to the next chapter of Being in Time, this is chapter 2, paragraph 12. Uh, it's called Being in the World in General as the Basic State of Dasein. Heidegger did not have a gift for uh, titles. But the good thing about that title is that it's absolutely accurate. What he's trying to argue for in this chapter is that being in the world is a basic state or a fundamental constitution of Dasein. And the, um, the essential thing is that being in the world is understood as a whole, as a unitary phenomenon. That he will say over and over again, Dasein is being in the world is a unitary phenomenon. But it can be broken up analytically. It can be broken up in terms of analytical distinctions. And that's what Heidegger is going to try and, Heidegger is going to try and do in the next chapters of Being in Time. In chapter three, he talks about the in the world part of being in the world. And he talks about the structure of world and a concept that he calls worldhood. Then he says in the next chapter, we need to talk about the, the who of Dasein. If Dasein is defined by uh, having a who character rather than a what character, then really who is Dasein in the manner of average everydayness? And he does that in chapter four in relationship to being with others, and that's a very interesting chapter. And then he looks forward to the next chapter, which is chapter five, which is really where things get, get going in being in time, where he, he asks the question, what does it mean to be in at all? What does it mean to be in the world at all? And um, that's going to take us into a discussion of the central concept of being in time, which is the idea of thrown projection. Dasein is thrown into the world and having the capacity to project out of that thrownness. Or well, the other way Heidegger expresses that is that Dasein exists factically. Having said that, let me make another little terminological distinction, a bit of housekeeping before we finish. Now, Heidegger makes a distinction um, in chapter two of Being in Time between um, a kind of factual understanding that human beings can have of themselves um, and the factuality of objective things in the world, the factuality of 
tables, chairs, the fact that the microphone I'm speaking into, the table, I'm, I've got my papers on, these are, these are facts. Uh, but also we are facts. There's a factual character that we have. And this factual character that we have is what Heidegger calls facticity. Right? That we exist factically. We didn't just come into existence this morning. We didn't just come into existence when we decided to. We are thrown into existence. We arrive here in the world with all sorts of baggage, linguistic baggage, cultural baggage, personal baggage, all that stuff. That's the kind of um, network of our facticity, of our lived existential lives that we need to be able to make sense of. And Heidegger insists in Being in Time, and indeed earlier, that what we need is a hermeneutics of facticity. Sounds very sexy. A hermeneutics of facticity, a way of interpreting our everyday being in the world. And our everyday being in the world for Heidegger is first and foremost experienced as dispersal, as being split up, as being dispersed, split up, uh, spread out amongst things in the world. And um, we are, for Heidegger, a kind of temporal movement of dispersal. And the way we are in the world, Heidegger says, and he's going to make this point uh, more clearly in the next chapter, is characterized by what he calls concern. Concern. But this concern is not concern as, as worry. It's concern as kind of being occupied with or being busy with. So the way in which I'm dispersed in the world is in the way in which I'm occupied by things in the world, that I, I am, you know, looking at my phone, I'm looking at the street, I'm looking where to go, I'm looking for the signs that will take me to the subway or whatever it might be. So I am concerned, uh, I'm, I'm preoccupied by the world, I'm concerned by it, uh, and I, my existence is out there in a dispersed way. The key thing about that insight, which again sounds very kind of banal, is that first and foremost, or proximally and for the most part, most closely and mostly, the human being is not independently of, of its world. The human, the human being is dispersed out there in the world. As Heidegger will say, always already. And that's what has to be described. So that the, um, there's, a, there's, there's a phrase uh, in Being in Time, which, um, well, let me, tell you a, let me tell you a story by way of conclusion. Uh, that might be a more interesting way of, of doing this. Um, I remember um, I knew a, a student, um, when I was a, an undergraduate at the University of Essex in England in the early 1980s. And uh, this student was a graduate student and she, was, uh, she seemed very, very clever to me and I was very impressed. And um, uh, she was working on Heidegger. And I asked her, so what is it about Heidegger that really, you know, that really you think is so, so powerful, so important? And um, she said, uh, it could be summarized in the following passage. I'm going to read it to you. Her name was Fiona. She said, there's this passage. This is actually page 89 of the, the translation of Being in Time. I'll read it to you. Uh, Heidegger writes, when Dasein directs itself towards something and grasps it, it does not somehow first get out of an inner sphere in which it has been proximally encapsulated, but its primary kind of being is such that it is always outside, alongside entities which it encounters and which belong to a world already discovered. So, why is that so important? It's important because our fundamental orientation, our fundamental direction 
of our being in the world is to be out there always already amongst and alongside things. We do not first discover ourselves by turning inward, by asking ourselves the question, you know, uh, how can I really know whether the table that I'm leaning on is really existent or not? How can I really know that the person I meet in the street is a, is a human being or a robot or whatever? These are secondary questions. Our first relationship to the world is one of being out there alongside it. The word that Heidegger uses to describe that is the word fascination. Um, fascination. The word in German is benommenheit, that we are benumbed by the world. Benumbed in the way in which we are, we're taken by the world, we move with the world, we, we flow with the world's flow. That's where we, f we first find ourselves. So this, uh, again, seems uh, kind of like an innocent move, but it's a really important move, because what Heidegger is saying is that if we, if we think of ourselves as human beings, as kind of locked up in a, a cabinet of consciousness, as Heidegger says, encapsulated in, in a cabinet of consciousness, looking out at a world that is foreign and alien, then we're fundamentally misdescribing our existential being in the world. And the, the thing for Heidegger is not to do what philosophers normally do. He says, this is also a little bit earlier in the same section of Being in Time, this is uh, page 88. He says, um, Proximally, this being already alongside is not just a fixed staring at something that is purely present at hand. Being in the world as concerned is fascinated by the world in which it is concerned. If knowing is to be possible as a way of determining the nature of the present hand by observing it, then there must first be a deficiency in our having to do with the world concernfully. I don't know what kind of sense that passage makes to you, but the key um, inference to draw from that is that the way in which philosophy normally proceeds is by a fixed staring at things. And that fixed staring of things at things, which is usually how philosophers use examples, usually medium-sized dry goods like tables and chairs and microphones and glasses and pens and such like, that we can, on the basis of that fixed staring at things, we can then apparently deduce the question of, you know, what is the case and indeed, who am I? Heidegger says this fundamentally misses the point. Our first, the, the, way, the, the way in which the world first and foremost shows up is not through uh, a perception of it, but is through a concern for absorption in it, a fascination with it. So that means, it's the implication of this, this line of thought, um, that knowledge of the world, the way in which that's normally understood, that the area of philosophy that's called epistemology, that's concerned with how, how a, a subject can know a world of objects, Heidegger's not saying that that's false. He's saying it's secondary. It's secondary to our lived experience of being in the world, and that's what has to be described uh, first. So that's what he's going to try and do in Being in Time. Um, and the first step on that adventure is to, um, to try and get clear um, the question of world and to ask the question, what is the world and how does the world show up? And that's going to be the topic of our next episode. See you next time.